welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. If you have a Bible, Galatians chapter 6 this morning, the book of Galatians chapter 6. Pastor Josh at the uh, faith offering morning when he preached, he referred to Galatians chapter 6 and as he was uh, speaking, I leant over to my wife and I said, verily, verily. <laughs> it's old King James. But basically, it means truly, truly. Or scripture, whenever it's said, it means that you agree to it or amen. And when a term is expressed like that, there's a sense of importance or, or a certainty that is affirmed. And as he was speaking about Galatians 6, it reminded me, because I'd, I was already um, uh, had written my sermon or was writing my sermon for uh, the Malaga Church last week, and I'm preaching the similar message today, but about kingdom farming. The Bible is full of terms that about, the, about uh, describing the church and describing the kingdom of God. And one, one of those terms is a farm. We're likened to a farm. Another one is an army. We're called soldiers of the, in, in the kingdom. We're called a family. We're called uh, uh, various terms and uh, are used in Scripture to describe the church. And uh, F.B. Meyer said these words. He said, life is a seed time. It's an opportunity of preparing for heavenly harvest. The open furrows invite the seed and every moment and, uh, and every moment in some form we scatter seeds that will uh, inevitably meet again in fruition. Let us remember especially our obligations to God's own children. Now we're going to read a portion of scripture in just a minute. And Paul is using the imagery of a farm. And I'm a city slicker. I grew up in Sydney. I, I, I have no idea about seed time and harvest, about planting and reaping. I, every time I've tried to grow a garden, it fails. If you come along and have a look at my lawn, it's not the best in the street. I, uh, there's plenty of things that I have struggled with over the years, but a lot of people struggle with the whole idea of sowing and reaping. And this morning, we're just, I'm preaching a sermon called Kingdom Farming. I want to read from Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read 10 verses, and uh, the first 10 verses, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, so you can follow in yours as we go through. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin... You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way of Christ, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important, Paul says. Pay careful attention to your own work for then you will get the satisfaction of, your, of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word should provide for, the, for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant or reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who will live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let us not get uh, get tired of doing what is good and at just the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially of the house of those of the, uh, in the family of faith, especially to those of the family of faith. Let's pray. Father, I pray your word 
this morning would have impact in our heart. As seeds are sown into the lives of men and women today, Lord, help us to have vision for a harvest. A harvest of good things in our lives through the word of God. And I pray your blessing upon this sermon. I pray your blessing upon this people. I pray as we open our hearts, you would help us to have vision and faith for the future. And I pray this in Jesus' name. I want to talk to you about our field of labours, firstly, because um, when we start talking about uh, seed and harvest and sowing and reaping, we don't always get it. We don't always connect the dots. But think about it. What are the fields of our labours? Okay. Number one, if you're in a relationship, you have a field of labour. You have to work at that relationship. Everybody who's in marriage here today says either oh me or amen when it comes to working hard to have a good marriage. It's not just going to happen because you stood at an altar, you stood before a group of people, you pledged your life to each other, you said, oh, that's really good, and uh, it's, it's just going to happen for the next 40 or 50 years, and you're going to live in marital bliss, dancing around the house, enjoying your life for the rest of your life, and kidlings come along, and it's all, all, all going to be peaches, joy, and happy juice. Well, no, it, uh, it, it's not like that. Relationships are hard work. And in our text, Paul's talking about hard work. And he's talking about the field of sowing and reaping. Can I tell you, uh, you know, the five love languages that Gary Chapman outlines in his book. uh, Anybody know those five love, love languages? Okay, let me tell you. One of them is quality time, acts of service, words of affirmation, gift giving, What's the fifth one? Physical touch. Usually it's blokes that say that. Because <laughs> guys are into the physical touch more than that. Every one of us has a love language. Can I tell you, unless you sow into your marriage quality time, acts of service, these various love languages, you won't reap very good fruit in your, in your marriage. That's a field of service. That's a, that's a field of labours. That's where you, you have to sow seeds. I can tell you now, I know my wife's love languages. If I speak a word that isn't, a, 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 if I speak harsh words, I'll be in the dog box for two weeks. She don't like, she don't like harsh words. She likes the truth. And she wants an engaging conversation and she wants it during quality time. But if I speak these just these random words harshly at her, it affects her badly. And I want to tell you today, marriage is one area, uh, family is another. I we recently had the funeral of Matthew uh, Milner at our church in in Malaga, and one of the things that I learnt from that particular funeral. He is 24 years of age. Uh, uh, Dave and Amanda have been attending our church for a couple of years now. They, uh, they have four boys. Well, had four boys. They still have three that are alive. They had a previous child as well. I think might have died very early. Um, uh, and I was listening to them as they spoke at the funeral. And one of the things that they sowed into their family was the Word of God. They had time where they spoke with the boys and had Bible readings and they prayed with their boys. So much so, at this funeral, a lot of people said they'd never been to a funeral like it. We had, uh, it's estimated anywhere between five and 700 people there. There were people in the car park, just outside the doors. There was 200 in the cafe area. There was 350 in the building seated and more around the edges. And this 24-year-old, whose life was taken away from him so early, and we believe that God was in control, and so we understand that uh, uh, he's gone home to heaven. But as, he's, as I was there, and as his body was there, and they got up and they testified, you could tell that they'd sown good seed into their son. Because now they had a confidence that he was in heaven. So your field of labours is your family. What are you sowing into your family? 
Your field of labours is also your workplace. <laughs> Isn't it funny that if you tell someone you're a Christian and then you do something that they don't think is real Christian, they'll point it out to you. Right? Your words, your actions, they watch. They watch your life. People watch our lives. I've said to people, uh, uh, I believe that if the pastor sets this standard, people in the church like to set that standard and justify their existence. Well, I don't have to live at that standard. Well, pastors are sowing in their churches a certain standard, a standard of uh, communication, a standard of love, how they show grace, how they show mercy, how they encourage people. And so there are always going to be in our workplaces, in our, in our field of labour, people are going to watch the way you live and you're sowing seed. The church is a field of labourers as well. It's a place that we all share together. It's a place that we sow into together. Paul writes in, in farming terms and he begins to speak the church body without speaking about the church body. And he brings correction in the book of Galatians. In this corrective text, he's saying there's going to be people in church that are going to have problems. They're going to fall. In verse 1, he says, Brethren, if a man overtaken uh, is overtaken, or verse 1, where is it? It says, My brother says, if another believer is overcome by some sin, he says there's going to be problems in the church. And he says, this is our field of labours and we're going to need to help and be alongside each other and sow into people's lives and help them through different struggles. And he's talking about sowing and reaping, but he's also talking about the fact that some people are going to have trouble in church. Did you know church is not a perfect place? Have you ever met a VDP? That's a very draining person. Churches have them. Hallelujah. We have people in church we don't always get on with. I was listening to a sermon yesterday, and uh, I do that on Saturdays. I listen to sermons. I'm just crazy. I just love listening to messages. And so I'm listening to the sermon, and the pastor says, yeah, at one stage he noticed all of a sudden the people that used to sit on this side of the church all of a sudden moved to the extremity of the other side of the church. He said, that's very strange. Church people normally sit in very, very similar places every week. So he, found, he, he went to this couple and, he, and, and this family and he says, what's going on? Why are you sitting over here? And sheepishly they said, we're not getting on with such and such on that side of the church. It happens in church. That people have attitudes, they have problems, they have difficulties and it's not always going to be easy but this is our field of labours and we are called to work out some of the difficulties of life. Listen to what he says in verses 3 to 5. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will be able to get to the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourselves among, each, uh, among yourselves or with someone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. There are times in church when we're comparing each other to each other and there's going to be difficulties. Equally, in this verse of Scripture in verse 1, David Jeremiah says it's a verse of restoration in church. Church should be a place of restoration where we encourage and help each other. David Jeremiah points out three things. He said the, there is an aim of restoration in this verse of Scripture, that is to help someone come back or help someone in their journey in Christ. Two, he says there's an act of restoration, that is somebody getting involved in someone else's life. Today, some people don't want to get involved in other people's lives. Well, sometimes somebody needs help. And three, he says, the attitude of restoration, which is to gently and humbly help somebody. I believe the church should acknowledge the fact that there are going to be difficulties, there are going to be people who do go, go through trouble, and we need to help each other. I think many a saint 
Many a Christian believer has been helped in their journey with Christ because of another brother or sister in Christ sitting there and listening to them. James chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's interesting he says that your prayers matter, but he's saying it confess your uh, trespasses one to another. There is a time of confession and restoration that is sometimes needed. Getting honest with each other. It's my privilege that I have friends of mine that are 35 years plus, that are believers in Christ, that can be on the phone with me, can be in relationship with me. I can go and have a meal. In fact, I'm going, Darren Gim, who has preached here a couple of times, he's preaching in Malaga and I'm going to have lunch with him after service. I've known him. He and I are honest with each other and I benefit from sowing into that relationship. Just your field of labours, let me tell you, the Bible says if you desire friends, you must be friendly. You've got to sow seeds in that field. You've got to be vulnerable with one another. I enjoy the relationships I have in Christianity and I am now... Later on, you know, I've been saved 40 years and now I'm reaping from those seeds of friendship that I've sown into that. I really felt as I was standing there this morning that that's a word for you today. Somebody here today, you say, I don't have enough friends. Well, guess what? You've got to start sowing into the fields of friendship. You've got to learn to listen to people and not talk about yourself only. That's why Paul says, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. He's talking about church relationships here. He's talking about the field of labours of a church community. But one of the great things about church community is that we, uh, we can sow into friendships in a church community and we will reap from that. John Robert Stevens said these words. He said, slowly the spotlight has moved away from the one-man show, the one-man ministry, and shifted to body ministry. The emphasis is no longer on the individual, but on the great ministering company. I like like that term, the great money. That the pastor or even the pastoral team can't always help somebody or be there to help somebody and can't listen to every conversation and be there to help every individual that the church body can encourage and minister one to the other. That's why small groups are so important. And if you're not part of a small group, you're missing out. Because you form relationships that can last years and you can reap from that, sowing into that and reaping from that. Our modern world thinks it's all about the individual. That's why one person who's a minority can influence whether or not you're allowed to speak about something in a group. That's the way the world thinks. We we don't want to offend the one. It's like Mother's Day and Father's Day. I understand that sometimes because we've lost a parent or we lost a spouse, it can be painful to think about those really good times. But does that mean we don't celebrate mums and dads on Mother's Day or birthdays or various other times? For the sake of the individual, it's like the whole, the whole uh, uh, group misses out. And I want to point out to you that it's not about us as individuals that there is a greater field of labour and that is God's kingdom is likened to a farm and that we sow into it just as we sowed into uh, Africa and sown into uh, Zambia. We're sowing not just our finances, our prayers, our time. People actually went. They've built relationship over there that's going to help and minister to those people. You and I need to sow into relationships if you're ever going to reap of those relationships. I've been hurt too much. I don't want to do it. You need to forgive and look, look, look forward to what God can do through a relationship that's really going to help you in the years to come.
In verse 2, Paul says, Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love your neighbor as yourself. Have grace for each other. Romans 15, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. He goes on in verse 5 of Romans, he says, May God give us the patience and encouragement to help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. One of the great comments that came back from the funeral uh, around talking with people, uh, a lot of them I did not know. I was standing there and they said, the atmosphere was so good here. It was peaceful. It was encouraging. And I was thinking about what we sow every Sunday in that church. Our worship team, our, 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 our greeting team and service teams, how they sow into that relay, a smiling face and a shake of a hand. A conversation and a cup of tea and a cup of coffee and a, a bicky or, so, or two or more. I like more. Amen. Where you just listen to somebody and share in fellowship. And it builds this atmosphere that people want to be a part of. This is our field of labours. And this is one of the great aspects of church community is a support network that will help you later on in life. There are specific times when we need someone, another believer, to stand with us in prayer, to be a listening ear, to bring some comfort and encouraging words to us. And, uh, I, you know, over the years, one of my friends, he, he, he is a pastor in a small country, West Australian town. He has, his congregation has fluctuated between 30 and 60 for the last 30 years. Greg is such a good friend. I ring him up regularly. Occasionally I'll get in a car and my wife and I will go for a drive and we'll go and find him and sit with him and his wife on their farm. But many times I'll hear Greg say, I just don't know if it's worth it. After 30 years of sowing into that community, you know what he does? He gets a trailer. And in this trailer, because he's a, 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 a cabinet maker by trade, and carpenter, very handy with his hands. If he hears about somebody in the community, even 20, 30 k's away, that's struggling and doesn't have the money, maybe they're a, a widow, maybe they're a widower, somebody who's in difficulty, he'll hook up his trailer and go there and do the work for free for them. He's been sowing into that community for 30 years, doing stuff like that. Loving people... And there are times when I've just rung him up and I said, Greg, how are you going? And he says, oh, I just don't know if it's worth it. I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. I said, mate, keep going. You're doing the right thing. One of the, thing about, one of the things about Greg is he, does, he has no superannuation, doesn't own a house, but he is rich in the word of God and he's rich in friendships and relationships. His field of labour has been... That little community for 30 years, it's been his family, it's been his community, and he's sown into it. I want to talk to you secondly about sowing and reaping. Because farming people seem to have a really good idea about sowing and reaping. They know when it's going to harvest, they know when to sow seed, they know when to dig up the ground, they know when to fertilise, they seem to know uh, what season it is. All I know is it's change, the season's changing. I can see that the weeds are coming up in my garden. I can see that there's things changing. The birds are starting to sing a lot earlier in the morning and they're happier because the season is changing. And there are going to be seasons in your life when you, when you reap what you're sown. The problem is, if you haven't sown good seed, you are going to reap not a good harvest. Let me say the negative first. I'll talk about the positive in just a minute. But some people sow bad seed and then when trouble comes, they pray for a crop failure. You know what I'm saying here? 
They do things that they wish they shouldn't have done. They end up with weeds when they've so, uh, and they don't like it. And uh, man never likes weeds. It's part of the curse. <laughs> have you ever seen I hate pulling weeds. But guess what? I can pray over my garden and say, I break the curse in Jesus' name. He died on the cross. But guess what? There'll be weeds next year. You've still got to pull them up. There's always going to be sowing and reaping. There, and sometimes, unfortunately, that means you're going to reap some things that you've sown some years earlier in a, in, a, in a silly point of your life, and you are going to reap of it. In Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, it says, As long as the earth remains, there will be planting or seed time and harvest. Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Almighty God put these in place. And those things will happen. That's why Paul says in our passage of Scripture in verse 7, you will always harvest what you have planted, what you have sown. In verse 8, he says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. I know a woman, and I was thinking about this. Uh, I had to do her funeral way back in the 80s. This lady was um, very selfish, very self-centered. Uh, she, uh, uh, she was actually a, a bit of a relative of ours, and so we would see her at different times. And uh, she ended up dying, and I uh, was asked to do her funeral. Three people went to the funeral. It was, it, it was a sad time. It was such a sad time because this woman had sown only to her flesh. She'd never sown in the fields of friendship. She'd never given to people. She'd never done anything really. She was, she was a drunkard. Uh, she'd just lived her life. Uh, she'd been hurt. I understood that. She'd been through relationship uh, hang-ups, all that sort of stuff. But she'd never tried to do anything good for anybody. That's why the Bible says if you sow to the sinful flesh, you will reap of that. Because in the New English translation it says, because the person who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption, something that falls apart literally in your hands. Some people sow to the flesh and then pray for a crop failure. I read the story also about a lady who, well, this wasn't bad. This was actually good what she'd sown. She was a lady of, uh, of limited means and she used to be in the church. And uh, so when anybody got sick or was in hospital, she would sew or knit something. For children, she'd make little uh, toys, uh, stuffed toys, with uh, knitted uh, stuffed toys if anybody, any child got sick. And she did this for, for 20, 25 years. But unfortunately, one day she got sick and she went into hospital. The pastor comes to visit her. He says, how are you doing? Uh, I think her name was Doris. How are you doing, Doris? She said, I can't understand it, pastor. Everybody from church is bringing me knitted gear and sewn items. She reaped what she sowed. Literally. <laughs> It's a funny thing. We reap and sow at different times and we wonder, if you sow apple seeds, why do you expect to grow peaches? If you sow good things, believe God to reap good things. The Bible says, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. This brings me to a... A, a couple of good stories, and I want to encourage you. It's not all doom and gloom, and everybody said hallelujah for that. Amen. Many years ago, my wife and I, uh, when we our first church, we planted a church in Townsville in North Queensland. We left Darwin, we planted out of Darwin, and we, uh, we were uh, launched into Townsville where we didn't know anybody and we started a church there. We had a great time for, I think, over the four and a half years there, we won over uh, one to the Lord, literally one. 200 new converts, over 200 new converts. It was a fruitful time. We didn't have a church of 200, but we got a lot of people saved. We were in this building, and the building was, uh, it was an old Baptist building. 
and it was built on a rock on the side of a hill and the concrete walls were about, you know, a foot thick and it was, it was about 70, 60 or 70 years old and we're in this building and Townsville being hot, we used to open up the windows and uh, I, I became aware of the fact that some people are outside. So I would preach and I'd give an altar call. If you're outside the building, you need to know Jesus. Pray this simple prayer with me. And I just prayed it by faith and uh, every, people would come, they'd hear the music and everything else like that. It was a great time. We had a great time. Well, after a period of time, we realised that there was one girl who kept coming Sunday night, sitting on her motorbike outside the church. Her name, uh, we came to know, was Heather. Heather had been sexually abused and, had been, and was a barmaid. And after her shift on a Sunday evening, she'd drive to our church, sit on her motorbike and listen to the singing. And, and, and she, oh, she said, I wish I could go in there. I wish I could go in there. Eventually, she prayed a prayer. And she, uh, my wife became aware that she was out there. So my wife actually brought her into church. Heather stayed in church. She had massive problems. They were bigger than Ben Hur. And I'm telling you, you don't know who Ben Hur is, some people even. Anyway, it was, it was big. And I, I, I found it, I just prayed for her. But my wife lovingly cared for her. My wife lovingly cared for her. So a few, I, I think it was about a year or two after we'd had Heather to come into the church. We were called by God to leave that church. We gave it over to another pastoral couple and we left and went down to Ipswich. We lost contact with a lot of people in the church, including Heather. So after Ipswich, Ipswich was a, oh man, it was pretty hard. Hard going there. We went through big time trouble. We eventually went back to Darwin. We were the assistant pastors in Darwin for about four, four and a half years. We moved from Darwin to Adelaide. My wife was funny. She said, on the day we moved to Adelaide, she said, the only reason I know this isn't hell is because it's too cold. And we moved down to Adelaide. She, she, she followed me. She came with me. She believed it was God that we went there. It was just very hard at the start. I think it was maximum about nine degrees on the first day that we were in Adelaide, raining and terrible. And she, my wife's a tropical girl and she didn't like it. Anyway, so we were in Adelaide seven years. In the time that we were in Adelaide, we did our very best. We worked hard with the people. We had a great time. Saved. We just encouraged the church. The church became very missions orientated. We invested in missions and we worked hard on the marriages and the family. As we came to a close of our time in Adelaide before I went in, I, I became an itinerant evangelist and uh, we were moving from Adelaide to here. It was, the year was 2004 and we were moving over here with our family. On the second to last day, my wife said to me, I think our time is not hasn't hunt. She said, listen, sister, and she started pointing out all the things that she was discouraged by. And I was trying to encourage her. So we were staying in the city and we were, walk, we were walking down the city, uh, city streets and we we're just walking past some shops and I was trying to encourage her and she looked in the shop window and she said, I think that's Heather from Townsville. I said, no. It's been, I mean, it's 14 years or something. It's been a huge time since we'd seen her. I said, go in there, go in there, see if it's Heather. She goes in and sees Heather and they embrace. There's a lot of tears, crying. Heather said, I'm so glad to see you. Now, I want you to remember, Heather had been abused. She'd had problems with family, having children. She had been single. She wasn't married at the time when she got saved. Joe's standing there talking to her and she's talking to her husband and she's talking to her kids. Heather's got two kids now. She's happily married and she's serving God in a church in Victoria. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You know what? Right at the right time, God allowed that to happen to encourage my wife. The seed that she had sown 14, 15 years earlier 
was now coming to fruition to bless her life. Can I tell you that working with people is hard yakka? <laughs> There's an Aussie word for you, uh, Andrew. A- a- never heard of it? Well, let me tell you. It's hard yakka working with people. But it is so rewarding as God reaps that hard life. It will come back to you at a different time, at a different place, and it will bless your cotton socks. I'm telling you, my wife and I, that day when we left Adelaide, it was the last day we were in Adelaide, and we got on that plane, and we, she said to me, she was crying on the plane, and she said, it was all worth it. It was all worth it because of the one. Because of the one. Didn't matter what happened with anybody else. We knew what we tried to do. We knew our motives were right. We had gently and humbly encouraged people who had fallen and come back to Christ and in their walk with Jesus. But the waters. Friends of ours who were missionaries in Fiji were also had pastored in Alice Springs, the heart of Australia. They were there for 17 years. Prior to that, they were in Darwin with us. And uh, during their time in Darwin, there was one Aboriginal teenage girl that this couple would pick up and bring to church. Faithfully, they brought this Aboriginal girl. She was in a, a, a domestic violence situation. And they were just helping her out, bringing her along to church. She gave her life to Christ. She became a Christian. And for two years, that's before they went down to Alice Springs and then on to Fiji. Two weeks ago, Natalie, this lady who had been picking up this Aboriginal girl, she works with the um, uh, uh, like uh, Path West type uh, organisation in the, in the Territory. And she's like a state manager. And she had to ring an Aboriginal community and uh, organise some blood testing and some results that were going to happen in that Aboriginal So she rings up and she starts engaging this person on the other end of the conversation on the phone saying, blah, 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 blah. And you can ring Natalie. Uh, that's me. Anytime you like. And she said, Natalie, she said, I thought your voice sounded familiar. Turned out that that was that Aboriginal girl. 25 years down the road and she said Natalie and she was crying on the other end of the phone saying thank you so much for picking me up and taking me to church. Acts of service, sowing that seed and then in due season you shall reap. I want to close quickly. I'm going over time. The third and final point is all about endurance. If, when it comes down to farming, can I tell you, there are going to be seasons of life when it's not easy. But farming, kingdom farming, is all about enduring to the end. He that endures to the end shall be, somebody said it, saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Farming is all about endurance. He says, so do not go, uh, well, in King James Version, it says, do not grow weary in well-doing for in due season you shall reap. If you faint not. In other words, you endure the hard times. Good marriages means that you need to endure through the good and the bad times. Sickness and health, they say, that that we say in our vows. Family, our kids can get sick, our kids can stray, they can go away from the things of God, but sooner or later you will reap if you keep sowing in that field. Our field of labour is so important. Whoever you are and whatever you do, in whatever field of labour you are involved in, it is so important that you don't lose heart. Don't lose heart in your marriage. Don't lose heart in the things you do in church. Don't lose heart in being a Christian testimony in your, Christian, in your workplace, in your, in, your, in your field of labour, whatever field of labour that is. Keep going in God because you will reap if you do not faint. And what will you reap? You will reap good things. 
In verse 1, he started by saying something, uh, uh, that we need to do something good for someone. That is, redeem them, restore them in verse 1. But in verse 10, he repeats that thought. Listen, he says, Therefore, whenever we have opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. In our fast-paced generation, we expect... Well, sometimes that doesn't happen. You've got to keep in doing what is good for David Guzik says about this, he says, it is easy but dangerous. In the ancient world, the phrase, the kind of fear and weariness a woman was experiencing during labour before delivery of the child. It describes a time when the was hard and painful, but also finished and unrewarded. It is hard when we feel that way, but that is exactly when we must hang on, not grow weary while doing good. Section 4. Verses 16 to 18, Therefore we do not despair, but even if our physical body is wearing away, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction or suffering is producing for us eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison because we are not looking at what, we can, at what, we, what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. I commended the church last week in Malaga because we had so many people come. And when I was standing in the foyer, as the food's being distributed, I just took time to take it in. And I saw so many faithful Malaga Christians, people that attend Grace Life, Grace Life people, serving and engaging people in conversation. From the very start of the day, the building was set up. It was, everything went so really well for that, for, that, for that funeral. It was a great presentation of the gospel. But you know what we did? We sowed seed into over 700 people's lives. We sowed the seed of the gospel. It wasn't just the presentation of the, of the word of God. It was our acts of service. It was us getting alongside of people. It was us listening to people. And I commended the church last week, and I commend anybody who serves in the kingdom of God, do not lose heart, for in due season you shall reap if you do not faint. I want to close one final scripture and I ask the musicians to come. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labour of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You have in times past and you are now. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.